To start a new notebook, create a new folder and copy all the parts you think you're going to need to work on. Move the focus of your Jupyter Notebook to that folder. You should see all the same files that you just put into the folder. Make a duplicate window so we can work on two uh, notebooks side by side. Then open and run some of the cells in this example. Right away we see we've got a problem because we're missing a file, so we better copy it over too. Let's start fresh by restarting the kernel and throwing away all our old output. This time I get a name error because I forgot to run the first cell, so I'll run it. Now it finds the file and the rest of the cells do what they're supposed to. This CSV file is fairly complicated and needs a lot of indices to take it apart. Ours is going to be simpler. Start with the blank notebook, make a duplicate, rename it to match what we're doing today. No, I can't do any of this nearly this quickly, so I've sped up the video for you. Now let's adapt the parts that we need from the example. The imports look pretty much the same, so we'll leave them alone. Copy the part that reads the file and run it with the right file name. Looks like it works. Now print the shape in the first few lines to compare. The shape is two-dimensional in the example, but only one-dimensional when we read our data file. In the example, the shape is 5,052 rows by 8 columns for our result. Our file only gives us 1,113 rows, each of which contains a list. This sounds like it's going to give us some trouble. Sure enough, our file doesn't convert nicely to a floating point array. That's probably because the shape is different, so we better work on finding a way to make the shape have the same sort of characteristics. I'll edit our CSV file with text editor notepad and take off all the stuff other than nice uniform rows of numbers. Now the shape is right and there's no uh, text at the top, so I should just be able to convert the whole thing into a floating point array, an array of numbers that I'll be able to plot. The example pulls the plotting data right out of the middle of that two-dimensional array, but I'm going to create some one-dimensional arrays to make my life a little clearer and simpler before I do my plotting. I'll plot some graphs and see if they wind up looking familiar from the lab. Note the little 1E7 on the x-axis indicating that we're plotting time in microseconds and getting huge numbers. We can convert the time t into seconds by dividing by a million. Note that Python does common sense division, so even if you divide an integer by an integer, if it's appropriate, you get a floating point result. Now let's go to the plotting example to put the finishing touches on our graph so we can include it in our lab report. It also will show us how we can zoom in and see particular parts of the graph a little more clearly. The warning just reminds us that we forgot to put labels on for the legend. I get lots of warnings, and you probably will too. Change the x-axis limits to be able to see the data more clearly. If we zoom right in on this area, we might see something interesting. Adding a grid will make our graph easier to read. We can plot with multiple different sets of parameters and screen grab the resulting graph to put into our lab report. You'll need these data import and plotting skills throughout the course. So figure it out now and you should be in good shape.